So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you're calling in from today, we really appreciate uh, your being part of the Global Tribe, and uh, we really appreciate your interest in the topic today, which is Mexico. Lots of changes, and so we have three experts who are gonna be talking about uh, the business opportunities, what's changing, how things are evolving, what things you should be thinking about for 2019. And our first speaker is Raimundo Rodriguez of Castell Consulting. Um, uh, he has had a very uh, rich and deep uh, experience uh, within Mexico. He was the promotion and investment a leader within um, uh, Oaxaca, uh, the state of Oaxaca in, in in Mexico. He also worked for FEMSA, which is the Coca-Cola in Mexico. Uh, more recently, and in fact, quite a while, and since 2005, he's been a consulting manager with Castell, and he's going to be talking and kicking things off in terms of more broadly, you know, what's going on with Mexico, what's the situation with the new president. You know, we know ProMexico is no longer, although I saw this morning that there was an announcement for a new investment organization, and so what are, what should business owners and leaders be thinking about in terms of Mexico for 2019? So, Raimundo, thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing more. Thank you very much, Burke. Uh, let me start. Why invest in Mexico? Uh, Mexico is one of the most competitive economies for productive investment at the international level due to its macroeconomic and political stability, low inflation, size and strength of its domestic market, economic growth rate, and its capacity to generate advanced manufacturing, high technology products. In addition, Mexico is an open economy that, through its network of free trade agreements, guarantees access to international markets. The country offers competitive costs and strategic geographical position. It also has a young and highly quali qualified human capital. The economic program 2018-2024. Uh, According to the presentation of the economic program of the new president Andrés Manuel López Obrador, the Economic Development Commission will be focused on different areas, among which macroeconomic policy, industrial and technological policy and sectorial policies that include energy projects, infrastructure, telecommunications, environment, fishing, tourism, agricultural policy, labor policy, financial sector, and urban development. An axis that accompanied that campaign of the government is the fight against corruption. It's a big problem that has caused a stagnation of the Mexican economy. According to its proposals, for this reason, it will make among these objectives the reduction of current spending by making the state apparatus more slender and will seek a growth of in public spending without being supported by public debt. In this sense, a mixed fund of public and private investment will be established to trigger infrastructure projects, which in total could be between 25 to 30 high impact projects nationwide for the next six years. Growth of the gross domestic product is going to be estimated of by four per, by four percent. The president has promised during this during his government the economy of Mexico will grow four percent. He's going he's not going to increase taxes. This proposal implies keeping the income tax ISR at a cap of thirty five percent and the value added tax at sixteen percent. Competition in the financial sector. According to the economic program of the National Project 2018-2024, the structure of the market imposes barriers to competition that make it difficult to overcome the asymmetries existing between large and small institutions. Employment for young people. The president announced the program Young People Building the Future, and which aims to guarantee the right to education and employment for young people. Infrastructure. The next government contemplates projects to encourage the creation of propitious infrastructure to reactivate the economy of some specific geographical zones. And that will take some relevance for the logistics and transportation plans for the companies. In the road stem, the conclusion, modernization, or construction of at least 15 road corridors is expected to urgency 
especially in the south southeast region of the country. It includes the Mayan train. The president announced the construction of the Mayan train, which proposed that it go from Cancun to Palenque as one of its priorities in infrastructure. The Mayan train is project is a project that will be extended for the 900 kilometers from the original project to 1,500 kilometers from Palenque, Chiapas to Valladolid, Yucatan. The creation of two new refineries in Campeche and Tabasco that will produce 300,000 barrels of fuel per day is also emerging. In addition, the rehabilitation of the six existing ones was announced in order to retake the participation of the state through Pemex in the energy sector. According to the letter sent by the Mexican president to Mr. Donald Trump, the president of the United States, it will seek to reactivate the north of the country with the creation of a free or open zone to promote investment, productive and technological development, as well as the creation of jobs. Mexican customs are going to go south, inland, from 20 to 30 kilometers from the dividing line. In the free or free zone, the income tax ISR is reduced to 20%. The value added tax, VAT, is by 8% on average, half of what is charged today. Especially in these border cities of Mexico, the same tax rate will apply as in the United States side. That is, in California, they charge 8.5%, in Arizona, 8.2%, in New Mexico, 7.5%, and on the Texas border, 88.2%. Special taxes on production and services will be reduced to establish tariffs and prices for gasoline, diesel, and electricity equal to those of the United States. From January 1st, 2019, in the entire free zone of the border strip, the minimum wage will be increased to at least the double the amount stipulated at present. Areas of opportunity. With this economical and political perspective for the coming years in our country, Castle Consulting is convinced that there are great opportunities for US investors. So we reiterate to your orders to offer specialized advice in the areas of fiscal and corporate planning, accounting, and legal guidance. We can provide you specialized, specialized and current knowledge, relevant effectiveness and efficiency in the analysis and development of strategies to solve problems in order to optimize the profitability of companies. We offer also our support to help you to land investments in Mexico, and we offer an extensive range of professional services and a high degree of specialization in the next areas. In tax areas, the accountant, legal, corporate, and financial. We have a specialized, a specialized uh, personnel in uh, Castle Consulting, which is very well prepared in the money laundry area, and we are ready to work with you closely. Do not forget that we have uh, 12 offices in Mexico, from Aguascalientes, Celaya, Culiacán, Guadalajara, León, Mexicali, Tijuana, Los Cabos, Mexico, Mexico Diga, Mexico DF, Monterrey, Oaxaca, Puebla, Satillo, Zacatecas, and most recently in the United States in San Diego. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raimundo, and uh, thank you for being a member in, I believe you're, are you uh, dialing in today from Lyon? Can hear you. Could you speak louder? Are you in uh, Guanajuato today? Yeah. Yes, we are in, in Guanajuato. Guanajuato is the, the main uh, the main city where Castel Consulti is uh, is working. We we are actually are working with more than uh, three hundred uh, business throughout the country, from Tijuana to 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 come to to Oaxaca City. So we we cover a large part of the of the country and. We have a, a vision to, to emerge in the United States to promote and foster business among the countries, among both countries. Fantastic. So thank you for um, working there with Arturo and Indira with Global Chamber and uh, appreciate your setting the table today with the really good information. Um, we're going to go for our second speaker, 
to, uh, to uh, the Denver area and Trevor Jones. He's a co-founder of Lynx Global Intelligence. Uh, they're experts at geopolitical risks, understanding counter-terrorist messaging, intelligence studies, and complex decision-making. Uh, Trevor himself has a BA in psychology from Tulane in New Orleans, and he also has an MA in international security from University of Denver. You also work with ASU and all sorts of companies and organizations that have operations around the world. And today, you're going to zero in on Mexico and give us some of the, the concepts around what risks are available. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks, Doug, and, and thanks, Raimundo. I think that was a, a great overview of, of where Mexico is going and some of the new things the government's trying. Um, you know, we here at Lynx exist on a bit of an opposite spectrum uh, where we're looking at the risks around some of the opportunities so businesses can get a complete perspective um, about their projects and, and markets and activities. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about today is a, a specific uh, type of type of risk, an energy risk, um, a logistic risk. Uh, those of you who are in Mexico will have perhaps experienced uh, the lack of gasoline that, that occurred in, in, in parts of the country. I know we have another uh, global chamber partner, um, and, and he was telling me that he couldn't take his girlfriend to, uh, to the movies a couple weeks ago because of the, the lack of gas in, the, in this particular area of Mexico. Now, now the, the oil and gas risk, uh, the shortage, didn't happen everywhere. Um, but, but what occurred was as, as Obrador came on, um, as the new president, you know, he's trying new things uh, to mitigate some of the risks as well as promote some of the opportunities around the country. And, and one of the risks in, in Mexico, as it is in many places around the world, uh, is the theft of, of oil and gas out of, out of some of the pipelines. Um, and so this can be very dangerous, uh, you know, to do, and, and we'll get to that, but, but also um, it's, 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 a, it's a, a vast logistic uh, an economic risk. Um, I don't have a specific number, but uh, many mil millions or billions of dollars are lost every year just because of um, tapping the oil pipeline. So what I'd like to show um, everybody today is, is some of the technology that we use here at Lynx to, to map uh, some of these situations to better understand what's occurring on the ground. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen and uh, we can go ahead and zoom in on some of the pipelines that exist uh, the major pipelines that exist in, in Mexico, um, and then also uh, go ahead and look at the event that happened. So, um, David and Doug, can you guys see my screen? Can everybody see uh, the map here? Yes, yeah. we can. Great, just checking. So, um, these pipelines you can see here in light blue are the, the major pipelines. If we zoom out uh, on the Lynx platform here, we can see them um, all over the world. These are the the veins that bring us the, the life, the lifeblood that is uh, the energy that we use for, for everything from driving to manufacturing to a lot of other things. So very important for a lot of our analysis to um, look at where these pipelines are and some of the events that, that occur around them, some of the geopolitical dynamics that, that come with them. Um, here in particular, you can see some of the major uh, Mexican oil pipelines uh, emanating from the Gulf here. And we have a red dot here to represent the explosion uh, that happened on, on January 18th. If you guys will remember, after some of these policies were implemented, um, there was a group of uh, civilians around Pipeline um, in Hidalgo. Uh, they, were, they were gathering uh, oil and gas. Now, whether this, was, um, whether this was directly related to some of the Oberdor's uh, decision-making, that's, that's kind of up for debate, and people are still looking at whether this was a direct result of that. But essentially what happened is we had 131 uh, individuals very sadly uh, perished in this event uh, because they were engaging in, in the same activity that uh, some of the logistic changes were designed to prevent, right? So as, we, as Oberdor put uh, gas on trucks uh, uh, and, and removed them from the pipelines, it actually created a shortage in a lot of areas. Um, which, again, some think that uh, that shortage may have led to kind of increased criminal collection activity around um, some of the pipelines. But in a general sense, you can see um, this is the, the technology that, that we're using. It's a big uh, mapping. Form. We can use uh, almost any kind of data, pictures, videos. This happens to just be a description of exactly what happened um, that day. But, but we, we can see the world at night. As we zoom in uh, near some of those major pipelines, as you can see in Hidalgo, the, the attack, was, I'm sorry, the uh, explosion, sorry, we deal a lot with terrorism, it was not an attack, it was an explosion, um, very close to, to one of those major pipelines. And so uh, we actually use this tool to um, 
you know, help uh, advise a couple of our a couple of our partners and, and one of our clients on exactly which situations are happening where and and what's what's uh, going on on the ground, which we refer to as as the ground truth. Um, so, yeah, we can do questions too. I'm sure we're going to have a lot at the end um, once we get through it here, but. But um, more, more broadly, you know, Lynx is involved in analyzing these situations so we can help keep our partners um, safe on the ground. And uh, also then on the opportunity side, um, perhaps more along the lines of what Raimundo or, or, or perhaps David will talk about, um, you know, we can help uh, companies make assessments about uh, balancing the risks, right, the political, economic, uh, social, and, and also climate risks um, that go on to their, their meetings, markets, and projects abroad. So. Um, this is a great way to simply tell those stories. Um, you know, this, this technology isn't the kind of end-all be-all of the solution. We need a lot of consulting that we stack on top of, of what we're looking at here. Um, but visualizations like these do really assist us in, in understanding uh, the nature and dynamics of uh, what's going on in the ground. And so, you know, this isn't um, a top tier risk moving forward for most companies. This is a specific risk to human security um, small communities and, and really, um, you know, on the solution side of, of analyzing these risks, what we want to try and do is, you know, create a bit of human security um, in, inside smaller communities uh, and work on the economics there with other means like development and, and investment um, such that they don't really feel the need to tap the pipelines. With. Uh, so rather than take an uh, overly securitized kind of approach to, to the solution here, uh, we're going to really uh, look at, you know, advising on community development and making things a little bit more secure inside communities so they don't uh, feel the need to tap uh, the pipelines in the first place. So that's a little bit of what we're working on at Lynx. Um, here's our contact inf information, um, our direct phone number, um, and I'm happy to, uh, to of course, give my, my direct contact information up in, uh, in the notes at the end, of course, Doug. Okay, that, that sounds good. Thank you so much, Trevor. In terms of the risks, um, that uh, most of uh, the small businesses and uh, even larger businesses deal with in Mexico. Um, uh, could you kind of summarize some of the things that you're seeing sure. right now outside of the, the oil and gas? You know, what are some of the things that you're seeing, especially with the new president in place? Or are there certain dynamics sure. that they should be concerned about? Sure. Yeah, I think so. Just so so the community knows, you know, when we and, and one reason I focused on a particular kind of visual risk here is we do a complete assessment of about 120 sub sub variables or sub risks that fit under the political, economic, social, and and uh, and climate um, kind of capacity. But you know, I think Mexico is in a situation. Um, we deal a lot with with um, Colombia and Venezuela, other um, countries in the region, and I, and I think. Um, you know, just to kind of to talk about some of the opportunities um, in Mexico as well, you know, I think there is a, a low amount of risk regionally for businesses that are trying to um, enter into Mexico. I have a um, great conversation almost weekly with a small business owner or, or proprietor in, in Mexico that's working on something that's, um, you know, so it's it's there the, the amount of growth and the amount of stability in the middle class I think is 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 a huge asset. Now in terms of some of the risks, um, you know of course there are violent risks in, in certain areas, um, embedded, um, kind of codified calcified groups that have to do sometimes with illicit activity, uh, trafficking, narco trafficking, or human trafficking. These kinds of things. Um, you really want to do your due diligence um, in any country, including the United States of America, but of course in Mexico, um, about you know kind of what the um, attendant groups that are around some of the structures that you're working with might be involved with. And so that's kind of a uh, an overly diplomatic, overly generalized way of saying that um, just you know check on your partners and, and do your due diligence. And Lynx is um, certainly a group that can kind of help. Um, just do some of the investigative pieces in terms of the diligence as well. So again, a, a great place to invest, um, fantastic growing middle class, few risks compared to um, some other countries in the region. That said, um, I would say just doing your due diligence across the board um, you know, with the actors that you're involved with is a great idea in any, uh, any market, but certainly in those is key as well. Okay, very good. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, appreciate that. And then for uh, those of you who are watching uh, live, 
uh, send in your questions. Uh, we're getting some already, and so uh, we'll have a, uh, about 30 minutes at the end of, of the, uh, David's presentation and discussion uh, to answer uh, any questions that you have. So please get those in. Our third and final speaker is David Farka. He's the president of the International Business Group. Uh, David was actually raised in Mexico City. He's, uh, he graduated from uh, uh, UI uh, with a degree in biomedical engineering. And that was really David's early uh, uh, background. Uh, he then was involved in other technology areas and subsequently he's moved to Scottsdale, Arizona uh, with the purpose of turning his passion for cross-border business into his third career, if you will. Uh, so he's very conversant about business in Mexico from his own experience and those of his clients. Uh, we are partnering with David in, with Global Chamber in our organization's growth in Mexico. So David, uh, thank you for sharing your insights today around opportunities in Mexico for our members. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, and welcome everybody. I would like to start by giving a little bit of a background of uh, the current situation, economic and political situation uh, that uh, Mexico is in right now, which would lead us into uh, the uh, subject that I was tasked with, which is the opportunities for foreign investment in Mexico. So the first thing I would like to mention is um, the current political environment. Uh, the new president took uh, over in December, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, which a lot of people refer to by his initials as AMLO. And I would draw a, par a parallel uh, between the US and Mexico in which these two new uh, governments are on the extremes of the spectrum, one way far right, the other way far left. Um, but we've seen the same type of um, uh, environments that created these two new governments. And that's basically uh, the populations uh, being tired of the same old political uh, uh, parties running. And this created the opportunity for both the president in the US and the president of Mexico, um, albeit being from two different extremes, uh, getting to power and really uh, having very similar situations in which uh, they downplay the media, in which they have a very strong base of support. Uh, in the US, uh, it, they, they refer to it as, as Trump's base. Uh, in Mexico, they refer to him as I'm lovers. So that's the current situation that's going on politically. Um, um, AMLO's uh, most important task is to fight corruption, uh, to try to uh, better the situation as far as uh, safety uh, goes in Mexico. So it'll be interesting to see how it all develops. Um, there is uh, not in Mexico, we, it's not really referred to as racism, but classicism clash. Um, the new uh, base of AMLO or the AMLOvers refer to the mid, middle, uh, high to high class as uh, there's a term that uh, has come up, uh, which they use called FIFIs, um, a little bit similar to what in, in the US, um, the term deplorables became almost a, a, a badge of honor for uh, Trump's supporters. So we see these parallels going between the two uh, different countries. First thing that uh, AMLO's government did when it came into power was uh, cancel the Mexico City Airport project. Uh, that uh, scared a lot of investment. Uh, that was about a $13 billion project in Mexico City. Um, out of which three to four billion was already invested in the project. And he basically canceled the uh, complete project. So that scared off a little bit of uh, the foreign investment going into Mexico. We saw in the um, markets that a lot of the money that was allotted to uh, developing countries uh, and specifically to Mexico uh, fled to countries like Brazil. Uh, so that was uh, some uh, areas of concern. Um, some other things that the government has done, they have completely eliminated the agency 
that promoted um, uh, Mexico abroad from an economic perspective. That agency I'm referring to is ProMexico. Uh, he completely eliminated that agency, as well as another agency, the CPTM, which is the agency that promoted tourism in Mexico. All the campaigns that you saw around the world about um, uh, Visit Mexico, that was the agency specifically uh, focused towards promoting that. So those are some areas of concern on uh, how is that going to affect the, the Mexican economy, um, whether it's in foreign direct investment or uh, tourism into the country. Uh, on the same token, there were uh, two events that are key uh, in promoting Mexico, and they were held as a, as a badge of honor for uh, Mexican sports. One of them is the Formula One uh, race that they were able to uh, bring to Mexico a couple years ago. It has been a fantastic event um, uh, to help promote Mexico around the world. The other one, uh, it's a third year in the making, uh, just happened this last weekend, which is the WGC Mexico Championship. That's a PGA Tour event happening in Mexico City. And for those events, the government really supported with uh, healthy budgets to promote Mexico within those events. Uh, and it's been talked about that those budgets will be canceled. Um, I, a lot of the people really believe that this is um, uh, narrow-minded in the sense that what those events really, uh, the return on investment of those events is significantly greater than any money that's invested in those. But again, I don't, uh, it's, it's something that uh, he talked about during his campaign um, again, drawing a parallel within the U.S., this is not a surprise. Uh, both presidents, I think, in both countries are doing exactly what they promised in their campaigns. So uh, the markets at least have allotted for those uh, since the campaign promises. With that said, um, there's two more things to watch in, uh, currently in, in the Mexican economic and political environment. One of them is... Um, as um, uh, some of our speakers were, were talking about the oil industry, um, Pemex recently uh, was downgraded from a credit rating. Uh, that raised the race flag. Uh, there's a lot of uh, worry in, in, in that field. Uh, but at the same time, um, the precedent to soften those uh, worries about foreign investment into Mexico, he created a council for investment promotion. Uh, that council is led by his chief of staff, a gentleman by the name of Alfonso Romo. And Alfonso Romo is a very notable business leader from Monterey. Uh, so that's a very positive sign that you have somebody that's in the business community leading uh, this investment promotion uh, for economic growth in Mexico. So that's a very positive sign. And the other one to watch is uh, the um, uh, renewal of so what some people call NAFTA 2.0 or the USMCA. Um, one of the persons that was uh, part of the team that negotiated the, the agreement uh, later on when uh, President Obrador was campaigning um, was uh, a gentleman by the name of Jesus Seade. Uh, he was after uh, named Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. So that follow up with that NAFTA has been fully supported by the new administration. Um, what we would have to watch is how it, it plays out in the, um, um, in the US uh, as far as renewal goes. Um, I think that it, it should go through uh, with some changes maybe, but that's something that we need to watch. With that, I'm gonna talk about the opportunities now that we laid out the ground on what the current environment is. Um, it's not all uh, pessimistic. Um, people say that I tend to be overly optimistic and we go into the opportunities where I think there's a lot of opportunity in Mexico as well. I wanna start that by saying that the film industry is booming in Mexico. Um, all of you uh, that watched the Oscars light last night uh, saw that uh, the, the movie Roma was uh, awarded three Oscars, but more important than that, the director uh, got the Oscar for Best Director, and that the, that f last five of the of the last six years 
have been awarded to Mexican directors. So I think that's an outstanding uh, record in the film industry in Mexico is booming. And it's an industry that is primed for investment as well. A lot of those movies are done, are um, filmed abroad. And I think that um, that's an industry that, that uh, we have to watch for sure. Um, the middle class in Mexico is larger than the entire population of Canada. Uh, yes, you heard me right. Just the middle class in Mexico, it's larger than the entire population of Canada. This makes it prime for uh, a new consumer base for companies abroad that would like to offer their products. Uh, middle class is still growing. So that's something that's, that's significantly interesting about the market. Um, another area of opportunity as Raimundo was saying, is infrastructure. There's a lot of plans for large infrastructure projects in Mexico, uh, a, re a new refinery, oil refinery in Tabasco, the Mayan train that uh, Raimundo was talking about. Um, there's a lot of focus on the new government for large infrastructure projects. So construction and infrastructure is something that, that will provide significant opportunities in Mexico. Another um, uh, interesting industry will be social services. Uh, the new government is really fo focused on providing a lot more programs than what you uh, saw before in the country. So any technologies, any services that create efficiencies or create tracking on the delivery of social services is definitely an area of interest uh, in Mexico. Um, the other opportunity is that some uh, capital in Mexico from either large corporation or family offices, because of the current political situation, is also looking to diversify their investments. So I think there's a large opportunity for these family offices to place capital in foreign markets as well. Um, so not only think about uh, investing in Mexico, but also the opportunity to finding partners that would invest in projects abroad, um, it's pretty uh, latent right now in Mexico and it's a great opportunity. I see in uh, the franchise industry, which I uh, have some experience in, that the restaurant uh, franchise market, it's, uh, I, I believe it's coming to a, a saturation point. Um, so when we're talking about franchises, when you look at the services, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity in country, whether it's beauty services, fitness services, uh, financial services. If there are um, businesses out there that are looking for these type of um, uh, franchising uh, models, uh, I think the market is primed for that as some of that capital is moving uh, from uh, the restaurant franchises towards services uh, franchising. Um, security and, and defense is also an area of opportunity. As I mentioned, it's one of the focuses of the new government. Uh, if you look at the new proposed budget, all, every single government agency um, is going through what they call a period of austerity. So all of their budgets have been, have been cut, except when it comes to security and defense. And we've seen those proposals with up to a 15% increase in their budgets. So there's a good opportunity there, uh, whether it's um, in, uh, intelligence, security services, um, materials in that industry, there's great opportunities there. Um, there's also opportunities for acquisitions of businesses in Mexico when it comes to renewable energy. Um, there has been a cancellation of an auction for new projects in Mexico which makes the existing companies in that space in Mexico a lot more valuable, uh, meaning that there won't be competition um, in the near future for them. Um, so uh, some companies that are looking to get into the market through some acquisitions of those existing companies, I think are great opportunities at, at the moment. Um, as uh, our other speakers were mentioning, uh, manufacturing and advanced manufacturing in Mexico is also something that um, it's a, a great area of opportunity uh, for the reasons that they've already made, mentioned, uh, geographic uh, location and uh, trade agreements with over 47 industrialized countries, which makes Mexico a prime uh, exporter for those goods manufactured in Mexico. Um, another big area of, of opportunity, it's um, 
we've seen it in the last couple years in the US and Canada, a boom in the cannabis industry. Uh, this is about to open in Mexico. Uh, the laws have already passed where they allow for this. Um, they're about to start awarding licenses. So opportunities in industrial hemp, CBD oils, um, this is something that, that a lot of capital has gone into in the U.S. and Canada, and we will see uh, a burst of this activity in Mexico uh, starting this year, it's my belief. Um, we cannot talk about opportunities in Mexico without talking about the produce industry. Uh, Mexico has really grown significantly and invested in technologies, um, not only uh, to, to um, uh, grow uh, different products in Mexico, but also to process, um, give value added to those products. Uh, the industrial packaging uh, has been a significant investment in Mexico, making their product very efficient and very low cost. So those are areas of opportunities as well. And the last area I would like to talk about is the mining industry. There has been a lot of uh, opportunities, whether it's in um, fine metals uh, or rare earths like lithium uh, and mullet denim. Uh, I see a lot of investment going into Mexico in these areas. So that's in a nutshell a lot of those different opportunities. Um, you can uh, find my contact information through the Global Chamber uh, website. I'd be more than happy to, to talk about any uh, specific opportunity uh, to any of you. So that's all I have for now and hopefully that gives you an idea of what the opportunities are in Mexico. Thank you, thank you, David. There were 13 of them that I listed out from you. So your, 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 uh, your preface there about being optimistic and you know sometimes, in fact, always it helps to be optimistic to find these opportunities and you, you listed out some really good ones. So, um, so we're now in the Q&A section. We do have some questions coming in, so I'd like to touch the first question on something all of you remarked on, and that is uh, changes in the corruption and how that's being handled. How, how uh, Raimondo, you started that conversation, you, um, Trevor, you mentioned it, and David, you also touched on it. What are some of the things that will manifest? What will we see actually in practice that, that changes in Mexico? You know, there's, there's things that they're planning to implement, but what will business people see? Will these business people see any actual tangible changes uh, in, in this area? Okay, Doc. Uh, the fight against corruption by the Department of Mexico has encouraged in the assembly power last December. You're going to have to talk a little bit louder, Raimundo. We can't hear you. Can you hear me better? Here? Okay, since the new president of Mexico is in power, is in power from yeah. December he last year, he encouraged the fight against corruption, fighting against the cartels of uh, gasoline, and a lot of thief, corruption, etc. The, the results of that fight has not been sent, uh, filled have not been felt by, by the business community. Even more, the new president has been very criticized because he has employed a lot of uh, measurements, a lot of measures that are not classical or that are not uh, straight to, 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 to face that, uh, that fight. For example, in the case of the cartels of gasoline, he stopped the uh, the, the providing of gasoline to the cities of the center of Mexico, and it paralyzed the economy, it paralyzed the activities, and um, it were in danger a lot of uh, the productions. You know, for example, in the automotive industry, a lot of uh, items have to be uh, just, just in time. So the lack of gasoline could uh, danger that part and there are actually in the development on our parts of uh, any question, but it's been dangerous. And uh, uh, it's been felt that the research could be shown at middle term of the present. And uh, there is a lot of uh, caution. There is a, 
a lot of uh, businessmen that uh, prefer to observe better the situation and plan then what is what they are going to to improve inside the the, the businesses. That's why we can find, we, we can help business to to improve the the panorama. We can help them to 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 increase their the profits by helping businesses. If, uh, if we can go and uh, or, or you can come here and consult us in any of our offices in Mexico. Okay, very good. Does, for any other questions, definitely get close to the microphone because it's very hard to hear you. Your volume has come down since you spoke. Uh, David and Trevor, what will we see some tangible um, changes uh, from a corruption standpoint? You know, I think uh, it's indicative that the only uh, budget that's not in austerity is, in, is the security and defense budget, as David mentioned. So clearly there is an emphasis on fighting some of these issues right now. Um, my, you know, our analysis and some of, 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 of our fellows and researchers would uh, probably indicate that you need to intervene on a bit more of a community or a development level, economic development level, rather than a security, intelligence, and defense level. And, and, and honestly, that's coming from some people who have a lot of experience and, and think about the world in, in a bit of a um, securitized way, right? So, so unfortunately, I think, uh, as Raimundo said, you know, these, these, haven't, these policies haven't been felt yet. And until there is a concerted effort on the community level to intervene, um, it's going to be, it takes, it takes defense, you know, but it also takes a lot of development as well. Um, so, so that's kind of, I think, where we're, where we're seeing this, this headed at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Any, any comments, David? Or do you, um, I mean, you, the way you outlined these 13 different areas, um, you're clearly seeing um, opportunities for companies to jump in to Mexico. And certainly, I, I think uh, several of you, a couple of you at least, re represented Mexico, doing business in Mexico as safer, less corrupt, and easier than, than many, other, many other countries. I presume what your guidance would be would be certainly to be careful but also to recognize that there are plenty of opportunities and the fact that the government is working on corruption is a good thing, right, for business from outside? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that uh, one of the things that we will see is just checks and balances in the sense that you have now multi-agencies uh, looking at the different projects. So it's harder to... Uh, do corruption when multi-agencies are involved. Uh, a lot more transparency on the process, the bits that are awarded, the contracts that are awarded. Uh, so the society itself can, can serve as a judge on, on how those uh, projects are being awarded, number one, and number two, that they're actually at market pricing, uh, same uh, uh, similar projects around the world. Uh, so I think that that's positive if they can sustain that without making it uh, so bureaucratic that it's almost impossible to do business. So I think that's a positive thing for everybody. Um, and we will see just how the execution comes along. Okay. You touched, David, on uh, the opportunity in the middle class. And uh, you also talked about uh, social services, which I'm not sure that's related to it, or healthcare related um, type things. You mentioned about franchising, the beauty industry, financial, which I presume was going after the middle class. Could you talk a little bit more about when you mentioned the middle class, what, what types of products, where, where are we going to see opportunities over the next several years? Where are some of the best ones? Well, I, I think just in the, in the number one, in purchasing power, and, and number two, the, the uh, size of the market for uh, products and services is growing significantly. Um, you can even see it, not to get political, but you can see it uh, in immigration numbers into the U.S. Uh, in the last five years, immigration from Mexico has actually been negative, uh, meaning that people can now find a job, a decent paying job, feed their families. Uh, so there's no need uh, to go and risk their lives and, and cross a border 
to find a better life for their families. Uh, you're seeing that now mostly for Central American countries. And uh, interesting enough, a lot of those migrants, before they hit the U.S. border, are finding opportunities and jobs in Mexico um, as unemployment um, decreases in Mexico. Um, those that labor force will be needed. Um, uh, education rates uh, have been growing uh, in Mexico, so they're aspiring to to better jobs, more qualified jobs, um, and there will be a need for that workforce uh, in the near future. Um, so all the services that, that go towards uh, that uh, middle class that has a very stable job, that can now support their family, and now has additional um, money to spend in a little bit more of leisure uh, behaviors, uh, you'll see that increase significantly in Mexico. Okay, very good. Uh, Trevor Raimundo, would you like to say anything additional about the middle class opportunity? Oh, I just think it's a it's part of the demographics that we analyze that just indicate that it's a feels like a great market to be involved with, and um, you know everybody here I think probably works with American businesses that are working through their conceptions of of what it means to do business in Latin America. And because of that reason, I think Mexico is a great, a great spot to be involved with. Okay, sounds good. The, you know, when you, when you hear about CPTM uh, being removed and Promeco and the airport, and yet you've talked, all three of you have talked about infrastructure and, you know, what's happening on the positive side. So, so the question is, you know, relative to where Mexico had been headed, you know, where, where is the country headed with infrastructure? Is it just shifting um, and it's largely going to be the same? And what are the estimates around GDP? G Mexico has had strong GDP forecasts for the next several years. And so how would you expect those to be impacted by some of the actions that are going on right now? Anybody want to try that one? So, so I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Uh, when we talk about infrastructure, um, you got to keep in mind that the current president uh, at one time was uh, the mayor of Mexico City. Um, he, if you look at the changes that happened when it comes to infrastructure during his term in Mexico City, you saw uh, a lot invested in the roads. You saw uh, the, they call it the, the, the uh, second floor of different freeways within Mexico City being built. Um, there was a lot of money that was invested in Mexico City's infrastructure. To some criticism, um, and there's always gonna be criticism when, when big changes happen, uh, but I think that you can equate that a little bit in a more exponential level um, in, in, into a national level now. You see that he did create those uh, jobs for the infrastructure projects. And I see that happening at a much larger level throughout Mexico, uh, especially in the low income um, uh, zones uh, tagged as opportunity zones, which is the southern part of Mexico in Oaxaca, Chiapas, and Tabasco. I think you, you'll see a lot of uh, spending in those infrastructure pro uh, projects there. Okay, oh, that sounds good. Um, so overall, then, would you say that uh, infrastructure activity will be roughly the same as what had been forecast under the previous administration? And would you expect the GDP to continue? You know, it has been very strong. So I, you're, you're, you're sounds like what you're saying is, you know, things are going to continue to be strong in Mexico. Uh, yes, uh, there may be a lapse while they get things going. Uh, we talked about the cancellation of the Mexico City Airport. But that doesn't mean that a new airport won't be built. Um, he he uh, favors a, a new area called Santa Lucia for the new airport. Uh, something will be, will be built. Uh, might not be exactly the same project. Some people say that it's just a, a temporary cancellation. Uh, so he has the opportunity to re-bid uh, and re-award those construction projects that some people say were, were really um, uh, corrupt to start with, and that's the reason of the cancellation. Um, so whatever reason was and whatever the, the um, 
mindset behind that is I think there's still going to be projects involved, may not be this first year, uh, may be a dip in the projections of the GDP in Mexico, but I think that uh, within his uh, six-year period, we will see that GDP growing with infrastructure being a great part of that, uh, especially from a job generating um, point of view. Okay, that, that, that's great news. Um, none of you really talked about technology in the technology industry, and so does that mean it's not important, or is it that there's a lot of other things going on that, uh, that preempt it, uh, or are we just taking advantage or kind of forgetting the fact that there's a growing and evolving technology industry, uh, including fintech in Mexico, or, or am I wrong? No, I think that's completely right. And I think that um, as David talked about some of the need to um, distribute capital in different ways, like with fintech, it's gonna distribute and democratize the opportunities on the ground. And what I mean by that is, you know, for every, uh, robot application of artificial intelligence or self-driving car or, or, or any other application, there's a hundred more applications on the ground for how we can use technology to enhance development and security. And so I think that uh, those micro use cases as they, as they come along, whether they happen to be in infrastructure or, or, or produce, um, I think the FinTech revolution is really exciting um, across Latin America, frankly, um, in terms of how some of this, this capital can be redistributed and, 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 and worked into local economies. Um, so we've seen opportunities in blockchain, we've seen opportunities um, using tokenized investment to use development capital to kind of enhance what's going on with things like infrastructure, or other projects that have a social good aspect to them as well. So um, I think it's really exciting. It's, uh, it's all about digging in and seeing what's going on on the ground in those local entrepreneurial communities. Um, we've seen that across Latin America and I'm, I'm, I'm certain uh, Mexico's no different. Is, that, is, the, is it concentrated in Monterey or is it now getting more and more distributed to the, the cities around Mexico? I, I get the sense that it is being very much distributed to universities. Uh, I think that's right. I think it's distributed. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, to, to enter into this game, so to speak, you know, to get going, you don't need much more than, than a computer and an internet connection. So, you know, again, as that technology is distributed and democratized kind of around the, around the world, but, but, but particularly in the markets we're talking about, it's very exciting to see how things like machine learning um, can be applied to the local use case. And that's where the rubber really hits the road in terms of of the technology. Um, it's always easy to sit back here and be armchair theorists here in the United States and think about these applications, but if you go in country and, and ask what's going on, on the ground, you, I think you find entrepreneurs all over the place that are working on, the, on this kind of stuff. Okay. David, is that what you're saying? And Raimondo, the same thing, that this, these are things that have come to Leon, these in Querétaro, uh, all across uh, Mexico. Yes. Uh, thank you for bringing up the, the, the technology aspect of it. Um, in in uh, the previous decades, we saw that a lot of the labor force went into manufacturing. Uh, now, it, it, with a, a, a skill of coding, you see a lot of these uh, worker bees going into the technology industry. Uh, one of the big hubs is also in the Guadalajara and Zapopan area. Um, they're not only uh, large businesses doing programming, but there's also large businesses doing the hardware side of things. A lot of the IBM computers are being built down there. Uh, HP has large factories down there. Um, one of the largest uh, publicly traded Arizona companies, Avnet, has a large facility down in Guadalajara. Uh, you see companies like um, a, a, a member of the Global Chamber in Tiempo de Development that has a lot of offices down there uh, with programmers. Uh, because uh, finding that amount of programmers for the uh, jobs that they have in the U.S., it's becoming tougher and tougher. Um, so that's an area definitely of opportunity uh, in Mexico when it comes to both hardware and software. Okay, interesting, because it's gone from what was a nearshoring supplying the U.S. now to supplying Mexican advanced manufacturing 
facilities and the fintech industry. And so, so this evolution is happening right in front of us. Raimondo, I presume that that's what you're seeing in Leon and in, in other locations that you're involved with all across Mexico. Yeah. We can take a from uh, foreign investment. And they, uh, they employed a lot of research and development uh, policies. So they, um, they can improve the process to change uh, uh, the board or the board or they would say uh, using other kind of uh, processes that uh, they can uh, Sounds like we're breaking up there, so we're going to have to move on to the, 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 the final question. The ability to produce a, a technology, for example, uh, we know that in the state of Querétaro, the state university and, uh, and the university that came from the state of Arkansas and studies there are, uh, are working on and are orientating their, their studies to the aeronautical group because in this area uh, is uh, one of the most important areas of our okay thank you uh, we're you're breaking up so it's very hard to hear so the final question is around sustainability i believe it was david who mentioned renewable energy as one of the 13 or so opportunities so in terms of whether it's climate change or energy or green economy you know what are you seeing in mexico what's what's evolving and is it important enough now that that companies from outside should be involved um what what are you seeing david so um again i think that that there's a a push for uh this area but it's not only like you see it around the world of solar farms being built wind farms being built which is a great opportunity, and, and um, especially as I mentioned, the acquisition of current companies that are in that field, because we will see uh, a little bit of a barrier of entry in, in the next year or two for new companies to get involved. So I think that uh, investing in the companies that are already existing, uh, it's an area of opportunity. But you also see on the other end, somebody has to build those wind turbines. Somebody has to build those solar panels. And you do see those industries uh, popping up in Mexico as far as manufacturing what you need to build those farms is. Uh, so the, the, those are the two areas that I see within that industry as opportunity within Mexico. Okay, and you touched on services that, you know, that brings the, the need for all sorts of services. You mainly were, I think, talking about consumer side, but on an industrial side services as well. So thank, thank you for sharing all of those. I've, yeah, what we'll end up one doing. Thing, yeah, one sure. One last thing, uh, also when you build these large infrastructure projects, you're gonna need to, uh, to have the delivery system for those. So all of the network of delivering that energy are gonna be large infrastructure projects for the government as well. Fantastic. We've come to the last uh, of our hour. So thank you three, Raimondo, Trevor, and David for your expertise and your sharing. Uh, we will put together a blog post that uh, both answers any additional questions that you may have. So please send them in to info at globalchamber.org if you have any additional questions or contact any of the speakers, feel free to do that. If you are unable to, you know, send an email to the info at and we'll find a way to get you in. You know, included in that conversation, in that in that post, will be you know, a little bit more granularity around some of the, the uh, opportunities. At the end of the day, you've got to talk to somebody. And so what we've got with Raimondo and David in particular is, from a standpoint of opportunities, these are people that you need to connect up with. In the case of Trevor, similarly, he's got a very, he and his team have a very broad view of opportunities, but also, you know, temper that with you know, the, the risks that are involved with doing business, not just there, but in other places. So whenever we're going out to the world, we have to, to look at this opportunity versus another and what are both the dollar benefit and also the risk potential downside. And so we've got a great distribution of, of knowledge in that area between the three of you. So thank you very much for that today. 
Thank you everyone who's uh, been attending today, both live and, and recorded, and uh, follow our next webinar coming up, I'm sure, in the next few days. Thanks everybody for sharing. Keep staying global and welcome, and thank you to the Global Tribe. Thanks everybody.